Hello, hello, and good morning, everybody. Nina here with Real Talk, and today's guest is Chris Bogue, and I am super excited to have him on because, well, you'll find out in a second. So, hey, Chris. Hey, Nina. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks for having uh, me. I expect you to play whatever that thing is that you play sometimes. Um, it's a... Uh, it's a wind synthesizer. It's a wind synthesizer. Wow. Okay. I would have said it's a plastic, plastic. Um, what are those things called? Um, uh, I can't think of it. It um, looks like a clarinet. It's clarinet. Like a, there we go. No, yeah. It's a, I call it the magic stick because it's just like a stick that plays like hundreds of different instrument sounds. Um, That's pretty cool. But yeah, I'm Chris Bogue. Uh, that's me. Um, okay, so Chris, introduce yourself. And 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 yeah, so you're you're in our world, in my world, in the video world, but you have a very very specific, interesting, and fun, dare I say, niche. So please introduce yourself, Chris. Yeah, well, my name is Chris Bogue. I am a writer and a comedian and a sales coach living in Chicago. So. I did uh, tech sales for about 10 years. I did comedy for much longer than that. I've been doing comedy since I was a teenager. And um, I coach people how to get on video. So sometimes that's uh, entrepreneurs, sometimes that's executives, sometimes that's sales teams. Uh, but I specialize in super short videos. So uh, if your audience wants to follow me, they can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Chris Bogue, and you can... Ring my bell because I'm a content creator and I make content there every day. Uh, a lot of it sketch comedy based. So find me on LinkedIn, follow me, be my friend. And, um, you know, I try to post funny stuff often. Well, I mean, everything I've watched and I've stalked you. So normally, I, I, you know, I get prepared for my guests, obviously. And I must tell you, I spend probably triple, if not four times the time on you than I would normally because your content is super it's fun. It's entertaining. It's, um, dare I say, sometimes a lot from my taste on the campy side, but, you know, on, on the good campy side. Mm -hmm. And so my biggest question, and I know you should always save your biggest question for like somewhere in the middle when the audience is warmed up. But I am so um, I just want to ask. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead is how the hell do you get people to be funny? I mean, <laughs> Do we all have a funny bone that we don't know? Do, do some people like just innately? I mean, yeah. How does that work? Because I would be mortified um, to to work with you. Um, I think my imposter syndrome <laughs> and my perfectionism would be just fl flailing all over the place. <laughs> no. Well, that's the thing is everybody is funny. Everybody is funny. I come from a school of comedy that teaches everybody is funny and anything can be funny. And part of what I'm doing on LinkedIn is I'm trying to show corporate America that you can have fun with topics that they didn't think were fun. Okay. And, um, you know, my last sales job before I started my business, I was working with college professors. So I was selling to university professors. I was not doing comedy. I was on a comedy dry spell for like four years. Um, but, you know, if I'm working with an accountant, I can make accounting funny, you know, um, because what you're doing is you're looking at the people behind it. And I was trained at Chicago's Second City, which if your audience is unfamiliar, it is a comedy theater that has been around since the 1950s. And uh, that's where a lot of everybody's favorite SNL performers uh, first mm -hmm. learned comedy. So yep. John Belushi, Bill Murray, Chris Farley, Mike Myers, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, all these people, they came from the Second City. Wow. And what they teach you at Second City is, one, how to improvise. So how, how do you walk onto a stage with nothing and just turn it into an entertaining show like that? Yeah. Um, and they teach you to look for comedy in truth. Okay. So, um, you know, like a lot of what I do with my humor is it's all about building the context. You know, mm -hmm. I was never like the outrageously funny guy in the group. I was actually always the straight man. Mm -hmm. um, I was not like a Will Ferrell type who he's just like big and zany. Yeah. Um, I'm much more of an everyman, you know, and, and a lot of my humor is just reacting to things. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of my comedy is me putting myself into a crazy situation <laughs> and the audience is laughing at the way I'm reacting to it because they yep. sit there and think, oh yeah, you know what? If I was in a ridiculous situation like that, I'd 
probably be reacting that way too. Yeah. And um, yeah, comedy is all about going for for what is real. So um, if your audience hasn't seen it, what I do is I, I run a weekly show and it's called Chris Sells His Soul, uh, Thursdays at three on LinkedIn Live. And um, I have different guests on and sometimes I bring on comedians, but sometimes I'm bringing in, you know, v a VP of sales or uh, my guest this week, you know, he's, he's a man who does work with vulnerability and DEI. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, these are not topics where people have traditionally felt that it's, it's okay to laugh. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I write a sketch where it's me writing for them because, uh, you know, my, my background is I was writing shows for performers. I was writing yeah. shows that I was not in. Um, so I write a sketch, but I basically just allow them to be themselves and they film it talking into their um, phone and the lines are very simple. Um, but then once I edit it and I throw my characters in there and I'm reacting and I, I have all these crazy things I do with the editing, it's okay. really funny. And um yeah, everyone who's on my show gets super nervous because they don't know how the sketch is going to turn out. And it's always so funny because I, I'm writing around what's real about them. Yeah. So so this, this sort of partially answers a, a, the follow-up question I had. And um, that's like, so you, you basically, the, the comedy is not in the performance of your clients as much as it is in the contextualization of it the editing of it. And I, I've, I've watched a lot of your pieces and I mean, it's really um, the editing you do is, is quite extensive. Right. And it's very funny and it's very like on point. So it's really about uh, pu putting, giving, giving your clients context that makes it even funnier than just them performing. Do I, do I see that correctly? Well, so I have to make it a, so there is a difference between the content I make for myself and okay. the way I coach my clients to make yeah. content. Yeah. Um, because I, I tell my clients the reason why my content contains sketch comedy is because I was a sketch comedian for 15 years. Yeah. You know, I spent thousands of dollars taking those classes, those shows that I wrote. Um, those took a long time to write and produce and cast and direct and put up. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, my stuff has sketch comedy in it because if it didn't, I would be leaving out this huge area of expertise, you know, that's actually very interesting to my audience. Right. Um, I actually call what I do soliloquy training. Mm -hmm. So um, if somebody signs up for like a three month coaching package with me, it's not a three month sales coaching. That's a three month soliloquy. And I call it soliloquy because it's the same thing Shakespeare did. It is this old trick where if you just talk straight to the audience, if you break that fourth wall and you talk directly to the audience, you can say pretty much anything you want. And, um, you know, Shakespeare did it. Uh, Parks and Rec did it. The Office did it. Ferris Bueller did it. All these beloved pop culture staples. Um, it's just like the, the main character just talking right to the audience. So I say my soliloquy was comedy. That was me doing stand up. That was me doing improv and sketch. So of course I'm going to bring that into my content. Yeah. Um, but for some people, they have their soliloquy at church. You know, that's, that's where they're connecting with their audience or they're a teacher, mm -hmm. you know? So their performance was, they would get up there and they would get really passionate about teaching. So if I'm working with someone who's a teacher, I'm not instructing them to go up there and do sketch comedy. I'm instructing okay. them to go up there and teach. Yeah, you know, because that's the version of themselves that's natural, and that's the version of themselves that's funny. If you just go out there as a teacher, and you're just saying what you know, like comedy happens in these little unguarded moments, mm -hmm. and um, people, I, I encourage people to get on video because I find that once people start doing it, they realize like, oh, I'm better at this than I thought, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's like, yeah, it's going to be different for everybody, but it's like, I, I feel that um, work and home have blended together mm -hmm. since COVID and um, it's, it's forcing, it forced things to change and it's forcing us to think about people differently. And we no longer have the work self and the personal self. They, they kind of just melded together. So and they have to, I, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. And I, so, um, and, and it, it, it's come up in the, in the questions. Um, give me a definition of soliloquy. Soliloquy. Um, 
I mean, that's so, so like, just by definition, that's just like a character talking to the audience. So like the famous one from Shakespeare was Iago mm -hmm. uh, in Othello. And Iago was this, you know, tremendously evil character. And what he would do is he'd sit there in the middle of the scene, he'd look at the audience and go, hey, check this out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ruin these people's lives. Watch yeah. me. And then he goes right back into the scene. Yeah. Um, so it's basically, so, okay, so many questions. So with the breaking the fourth wall and being a character, um, you're kind of bringing the clients or your audience, sorry, you're bringing your audience in as as your they're like your partner in crime now right they're 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 bought into the story well and i'm a sales guy too mm -hmm. so here's the thing i teach people how to get on a program like vidyard or they, they make all these programs that integrate video into linkedin and gmail mm -hmm. yeah and, and i did the same um, thing with dub so yeah yeah. So, uh, you know, Nina, uh, people don't like being sold to, yes. <laughs> they don't like being cold pitched. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to get someone's attention, especially in the year 2022. Yeah. But I discovered by getting on video. And again, I was selling to elite college professors, very, you know, they got a bit of an ego to them. They're at the top of these institutions. Um, they hate cold callers. They hate being spammed. They hate being emailed. But if I showed up on video and I'm like, Hey, uh, Dr. Smith, I'm the guy that sent you 10 emails. That might've been a little much. Um, here's why I want to meet with you. <laughs> you yeah. did this and I know you studied this and I think I could help your class have more assignments based on critical thinking, you know? And, um, it was one of these things where I found that if I commented on the situation, Mm -hmm. It was able to kind of take us both out of it. Yep. You yep. know, and as a salesperson, you're often thrust into these situations where you're on your heels, you're on the defensive, people are blocking you, you're getting spam filter blocked. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes it's for things that you didn't do. Your marketing team maybe sent out some really clumsy, you know, personalized emails that just did not perform well. Yeah. Um, but something about just being able to look straight at the camera and you, when you look straight at the lens, you are making perfect eye contact with your audience. And I found just being like, Hey, sales, <laughs> how awkward. Anyway, I'm Chris and I'd like to meet you. Yeah. It's just, it cuts through the noise. It cuts yeah. right past gatekeepers. Yeah. And so I quit my job because I was like, Oh wow, this is more powerful than I realized. And business schools don't teach it. Yeah. They don't teach you how to get on video. They don't teach you how to make content. No, no, no. Um, they haven't caught up to that yet. So I'm like, oh, if I just get out there on video, who can stop me? <laughs> you know, no, no one can stop you. You can get yeah. in front of pretty much anyone. And um, I don't know. I feel there's like a lot of pretension in the corporate world, uh, just like there was in the academic world. Yeah. And I have found there is something so welcome about being available and disarming. And, um, you know, I, I've just been around so many corporate types who they flaunt their title and they flaunt their accomplishments and they flaunt their wealth. And I found just showing up with, as a guy with a cup of coffee being like, oh, hey, LinkedIn, right? Anyway, you want to chat? Um, mm -hmm. It works. Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, I, these, it, the plug, the plug in, um, you know, uh, video hosting companies like you use Vidyard. I'm, I'm a big fan of dub and they've, they've been always very supportive of us. Um, same thing. They have uh, Chrome plugins to leave messages directly in people's inboxes. I find that to be, I actually don't use it enough, frankly, should, should, should use it more. One of those. Why is that? Why is that? Um, Cause yeah, that's a good question. Why is that? So I want to, and, and it, within what I'm asking you next is might be the answer for me personally. Uh -huh. So, um, so when, you know, when I teach my clients to do video, um, you know, I, I harp on the whole, like, you, you got to look at that green dot on your computer or the little dot on your phone, come hell and high water. Cause the re whole reason why you're doing these videos is so you connect with your audience. And you, and if you're like, you know, looking all over the place for your cheat sheets and God knows what, you're not going to make that connection, right? And you're a missed opportunity. Might as well just go back to bed and, you know, snooze for a little longer. <laughs> so um, so where's the difference? And I think I know the answer, but I, I want to hear it from you or I have an idea in my head, I should say. Where's the difference between being in character and and engaging with that green light 
and being you and engaging in that with that green light is there a difference or is it uh, is it a shift what what, what happens there Ooh. because you're talking from solilic I can't even pronounce that word and, and i just say you know find your voice you know it's sort of a little hack hackish so um yeah yeah go ahead. So this is an interesting thing because, again, I, I come from a type of training where it's like you find comedy in the things that are real. Mm -hmm. And the example I give is um, many of the characters that everybody loves on Saturday Night Live are a person doing an impression of their dad. <laughs> like Mike Myers, Austin Powers, that was him doing an impression of his dad. His dad was a British performer. You know, and he always had a cheesy smile and he was a song and dance man. And yeah, that voice was just Mike Myers doing the best impression of his dad. Okay. And um, they teach you in Second City, wear your character as lightly as you would a cap that you could discard if you needed to. So um, when I do, when I teach straight up character work, you know, which is not, not all my clients want that. A lot of my clients, they're just doing straightforward, you know, them talking to the camera, but TikTok is very popular now and multiple cameras is, or multiple characters is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and people want to learn it. And what the trick to that is, you are just playing a different version of yourself and you are leaning into a different energy. So, um, you know, maybe you're playing a more impatient version of yourself. You know, or maybe you're playing a little bit more, uh, you know, overly anxious version of yourself um, or a more excited version of yourself. You are still, it is still you. You are just holding on to a different energy. And what I train my clients to do is I say, okay, you're no longer you. You are 10 different people, right? And you got to decide which version is going to show up on camera. So I was working with a consultant once. Uh, she had she had a healthcare consultancy, and um, you know we were coming up with video ideas for her. And so I'm like, okay, so here you are in your office. You're wearing a blazer. This is Lisa, the businesswoman. When you're standing here, you can talk about things in business. You could talk about building a business. You could talk about you know mistakes you've learned in business. You can talk here because you're a woman who built a business and you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, over here at your coffee table, this is you that's Lisa, just the gal people are friends with, right? This is the happy-go-lucky girl who is mm -hmm. good at sports, who's just friendly, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're here, you're playing a more relatable version of yourself. Okay. You know, you can talk to the audience about real things. You could talk to them about your work-home balance. Um, this is just the version of you that just, like, goes out to dinner with people. Mm -hmm. You know, and then here's the version of you that's Lisa, the mom, right? And you're wearing a ponytail and, um, you know, this is the version of you that's a lot more practical, right? Maybe a little mm -hmm. more frustrated, um, you know, maybe a little bit cheekier, um, but you can talk about different things here. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you get yourself thinking about like, okay, well, I'm the business guy and I'm the comedian, and I'm the softball player, and I'm the mediator, and I'm the negotiator. And you start thinking about these different versions of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then we break down the audience too. So um, no matter who I'm working with, whether it's a business or a, an individual or a salesperson or an entrepreneur, yeah. we start with the audience. Of we course. visualize oh, one yeah. audience member yeah. and we put them in the audience and we say, okay, who is this person? Yeah. Um, what is the one thing they need to understand? You know, or what is the one thing you want them to learn? Or what is the one action you want them to take? I would say, what do they need to hear today? Exactly. And then, so you start with that and you go, okay, which version of you is the best one to show up to make that case? Wow. So, so for your clients, which I know you, you call your audience, um, so is that a shift for them internally to have clarity on how they're speaking and, or is that also something that shows when they show up on video? Like, is it also an outwardly, like, is there, like, for instance, I'm, I'm part of the Dames, which is an all female networking uh, community. And the woman who runs it, um, Megan Conter, absolutely brilliant woman. She actually has, 
four or five different characters and they like they have wigs and they have and they're they have different voices and she's a she's a very funny woman uh you should connect with her i actually told her about you already um and 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 she does videos as those characters but i would mm -hmm. imagine with your clients that that is much more subtle right um, yeah this is much more about just kind of like topic selection so like my mm -hmm. example would be like, for me, I've got a bunch of different audiences, right? So one of my audience is just salespeople, yeah. right? And salespeople, they want to learn about sales. They want to succeed at sales. And they tend to like edgier humor. You know, they tend to like corporate bro, if you've ever seen him, Ross Pomerantz's character. Mm -hmm. He's very popular on LinkedIn. Uh, he does very irreverent sketch comedy about sales. Mm -hmm. And anybody who likes that, you know, they might like my stuff. I'm a sketch comedian who does yeah, stuff yeah. about sales. What's so, name? Uh, Ross Pomerantz. Okay. Corporate, corporate bro is what everybody calls him. That's his character name. Um, but, you know, I make comedy that I play a boss character that's just called The Boss, and he swears a lot. It's all bleeped. Um, but, you know, it's very funny, and it's edgier humor. And that mm -hmm. is just something that I know the salespeople like that. You know, yeah. um, I also have a whole audience of people that hates sales, right? I have this whole thing about vulnerability and um, I'm not a jock. I was more of a theater guy, you know, I'm a, I'm a director of shows, not a sports coach, you know? So I've got fans who they are introverted, they are writers, they are content creators, they hate sales, they hate mm -hmm. hustle culture. Mm -hmm. And I also give content to them. You know, yeah. again, this week I'm doing a segment about, you know, my guest on the show. We're talking about DEI and vulnerability. What's DEI? And, uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, I forget what's so, that's the woman who's never worked in corporate. Yes. Okay, good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, but it, it's like I gotta give them them things too. Uh, accessibility. Yeah. I have uh, a lot of fans who are they are um deaf or they are for some reason without sound. Mm -hmm. And I write my own captions and I write jokes into the captions and I make sure my captions are just as funny as my videos. So, um, and I call attention to that too. I tell companies like, Hey, if you're not making your stuff accessible, you are leaving out people who want to hear you. You know, there are people who want your message and you're not allowing them to hear you. Well, so well, I have all these apart, things. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, apart from the practicality that 80% of all con uh, content is being consumed without sound on, right? So there's that too, especially for if we're talking about, you know, people without hearing. Yeah. Right. So um, I've got these accessibility fans and they like when I bring on guests about accessibility and when I talk about accessibility. So, you know, even just those three groups, I can look as I'm planning for the week and be like, which of these audiences have I not played to Yeah. in a yeah. while? You know what? I haven't done anything about accessibility in a little bit. I'm going to do something that the accessibility folks will enjoy, you know. I want to go back and listen to your talk about dyslexia. Um, that was just recently because I'm heavily dyslexic. So there's so much opportunity for um, fun, fun in that. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I had a guest on recently, Lydia Allen. Yeah. And she's exactly the type of person I love to work with because she, she is on camera all the time. She is a TikTok sensation. She is not a trained performer. She did not go to comedy school. She is a teacher. Yeah. You know, she works with dyslexic families and dyslexic students in schools. And, you know, she's a she's a very charismatic person. She's a good performer yeah. because teachers have to talk constantly. And she went on TikTok and she started talking to dyslexic people directly as a dyslexic person. And all of a sudden she's getting a million plus views on her TikToks. Wow. Wow. And by the way, bye bye, Kevin. Thanks for hanging out with us. We've we've, by the way, had quite a quite a bit of an audience and we have some questions which we might get to. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I found I found that I mean, it, it spoke to me immediately, right? And apart from the fact that she's absolutely, you know, lovely and and fun 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 to listen to. Um, so you have now brought up TikTok several times. Um, so I had TikTok on my phone immediately deleted it again because there were a couple of hours in the week which I don't know where they went, but they were they're lo I lost them somewhere on TikTok. So. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell my clients do one do one platform and do it exceedingly well. In our, I know you and I both agree that LinkedIn is a great place to hang out and be and stand out organically. So, so do tell me a little bit about TikTok because 
Um, when I have clients who say, oh, and I also want to be on TikTok, I'm like, why? You know, so so I want to hear the why from you. <laughs> okay, so disclaimer, LinkedIn is my primary network, right? So some people have completely turned their business around to be 100% about TikTok. I do not, like that, is, that takes effort. If you want to be TikTok famous, I say do not do that unless you have a plan for it. Right. And my TikTok stuff primarily promotes my LinkedIn stuff. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's a good idea for people to get on TikTok. And there's a few reasons why. Okay. Um, the algorithm is designed for people to go viral, even if they don't already have a following. So how TikTok's algorithm works is when you make a video, it sends it out to a group of about 100 people. Mm -hmm. And if it overperforms there, it gets blasted out to a much larger audience. Okay. So it's like, if you have a video and enough people watch it twice or enough people watch it a certain percentage or enough people interact with it, um, it's really designed, especially for new users, to just blow up out of nowhere. And that, that's why people love it. It's because you'll randomly just be like, what? And like, all of a sudden you're going viral. Um, so what kind of content do you put on TikTok? So TikTok is faster. I use, like, even if I'm repurposing my LinkedIn stuff for TikTok, I will tighten it up. Um, TikTok is very fast moving. I, the way I describe, the, I think people should think about TikTok is, it's like an international variety show. If you take a look at what's popular on TikTok, I would actually uh, suggest it's a lot like vaudeville. Mm -hmm. I, I look at TikTok and it reminds me of silent film. Um, it is very silly. There, It's a lot of music. It's a lot of dancing. It's yeah. a lot of flirtatiousness yeah. and salaciousness. And... Um, you know, it's, I say silent film because a lot of it is very, it's exaggerated. Um, it might not even necessarily be a person talking, um, but it is this fascinating platform where people are just going up there for 10 seconds and doing something interesting. And um, so the videos know, are all 10 seconds? No, videos actually, so videos originally on TikTok were like, I think up to three minutes was the max. TikTok recently upped that to 10 minutes. Okay. I don't know if anybody's doing 10 minute stuff there. Um, I actually recommend my clients do like 15 second stuff. Okay. And um, the thing about TikTok is it wants content all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you either have to get into a practice of just constantly doing it mm -hmm. or you got to get good at batching. So, oh yeah, I'm I'm the queen of batching. All um, my clients can sing a song about that. Yes. Okay. Batch, yeah. Batch, so. Batch, yeah. <laughs> um. But you know, it's it's just it is a thing where I, I'm a business owner now, and I have to look at where my stuff is actually going to get seen. Yeah. And getting it seen on Facebook is hard. <laughs> they, yeah, that's why I'm not on Facebook. Does, yeah. It doesn't yeah. work anymore. No. Um. But it's like you can't help but notice. You know. You, just throw something and it just blows up and you're like, Oh, you know, and LinkedIn, but, I, but okay. yeah. So blowing up and, and getting all the eyeballs, et cetera, is one thing. Are you actually getting sales calls out of it? Yeah. So, I mean, this is part of the story of my business is I am trained in this style of improv called yes. And that is yes. And is like the fundamental rule of improv, no matter where you go. Um, you can't determine where the scene is going to go. And if you try to control the outcome, it just doesn't go the way you want. But yep. if you stay to the moment, if you say yes to the moment and mm -hmm. you just find ways to be playful, um, that's what does it. So I was doing the sales thing. You know, I was, I quit my job. I was starting to sell myself as a coach on LinkedIn. I was making like thought leadership videos about um, sales. And then I started doing things where I would be talking about cold calling and I'm like, oh, okay, well, if you cold call someone and they're mad, do this. And then it was me. And then it cut to me in a different shirt, wearing glasses, like doing a Chicago accent, you know, talking on the phone. And um, yeah, when that started blowing up on TikTok, I realized that um, the, the comedy was more valuable than I realized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, the more I started throwing that stuff into my LinkedIn content, the more inbounds I started getting. 
And okay. um, I tell people too, it's like, you gotta, and this is the salesperson in me. Um, I don't trust the algorithm. I, I don't leave my fate up to the algorithm. If I make something strategic for my business on TikTok and it flops, I don't care. I'm gonna make sure the right people see that anyway. I'm gonna go repurpose that on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna find some way to get that in front of my prospects. Um, well, by the also, way, so you know from the metrics, I always say like you have to focus on the correct metrics, right? Views is a completely cockamania metric. No, I don't focus on the views because I can't grab those people, right? But people who like my stuff and comment on my stuff. I can grab those and actually do something with it, right? So that's the metric I care about. Yeah, and so um, inbounds is you know one that I follow. What are the types yeah. of communications that get me inbounds? Yeah, and I realized that if I threw the sketch comedy in, that would get more people looking into my services. So what I started doing is I started sneaking sketch comedy into my live streams. And I started putting sales pitches into my sketch comedy. So okay. I, I was because I had so many companies where they like the boss. I have this character, Vagman, and the joke is he's Vagman. very vague. Yeah, Vagman is like my audience's favorite. It's me wearing a cape standing in front of like a blurry, vague background. <laughs> and I just say vague corporate nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, and I started thinking maybe I should uh, maybe I should send sales pitches to these companies in character. And then I thought, wait a minute, um, if I've got sales leaders and entrepreneurs and prospects mm -hmm. listening to my live stream and watching my live show, I should just pop into character and ask them for money. So what I started doing was I have a segment in the middle of my show called Gimme Gimme. Mm -hmm. And me and my guest, I pop into character. If my guest is bold enough, they'll pop into character. Usually they just sit there as themselves and I go crazy and they just calmly tell the audience, you know, how to support them. Um, but yeah, I pop into character as the boss usually. So mm -hmm. it's me in a suit jacket and I'm much ruder and I'm much, you know, more brash and I'm much more aggressive with my sales pitches. Yeah. And I'll berate the audience. I'll be like, what is this, PBS? Huh? You people have money. You know, what are you doing getting all this comedy for free? Isn't it about time you pony up and pay for it? And, um, you know, I found I could really push the envelope. Mm -hmm. um, but I could also be much more explicit about, like, this is what I do. This is why you should hire me. And it just started working. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes I feel like I just want to scream at the audience, like, like you know, Stop with the fucking, you know, I have no time. Maybe this, in, in, you know, never today. It's never today. It's always maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe next month, maybe when this thing is over and that crisis is over. It's like, it's fucking life. There's always going to be a crisis and there's always, you either make a commitment or you don't, you know, yeah. anyway, don't get me started. So, um, <laughs> um, so, so how, and this is something I was really curious about too, from the get go is. So I work mostly with small business owners, um, service-based um, uh, business owners that, you know, have to sell themselves because they don't have, you know, the bake shop or the, the dog grooming business or whatever, where they can show their wares. Right. So, you know, this is it, this is what you're selling. Right. Um, how, how, I mean, I, I would, I would see my audience being worried about, people thinking that if you get into character or if you are, you know, that, 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 then they'd be nervous about being mis mislabeled like, Oh, this person is really weird or because people don't have the context within which you're operating with your characters. Yeah. Um, that's why I just show them, you know, I, I, I do, I did this whole bit. Uh, on April Fool, I did a couple bits on April Fool's Day, but one of them was just me. I made a compilation of me just failing. Um, I was trying to play my wind synth, and it's just me just screwing up over and over again and getting really frustrated. And um, I, the more I do out there stuff, every time I try to push the envelope, every time I think the audience is going to be like, hang on a minute. It's, we got to get serious here. This is LinkedIn guy. Come on. Um, nobody cares. In fact, just the opposite. People tell me like, oh, this is such a breath of fresh air. Everything is so stale and artificial and yeah. looking exactly the same on LinkedIn. I mm. like this. 
Yeah. And um, I tell people, stand out, get noticed. My um, So I think board game design is, fa- is fascinating. Mm-hmm. And um, I use a board game design principle when I'm doing sales. And I, I encourage people to adopt this. Um, so board game designing is all about you make a very rigid set of rules. Mm-hmm. And then you allow your players to break them. Yeah, it's like okay. The rule is you you roll the die. Whatever you roll, that's how many steps you have to move forward. Right? You have to move that many forward, unless you get a four, in which case you can move forwards or backwards. Yeah, yeah. And um, what I found is if you show up, if there are twelve conventions you're following, if you're mm-hmm. if you're a fan of lavender, uh, that that product that helps you write better emails. Um, and they've got a guide of like the 12 things you need to have in a successful email. Break mm-hmm. one of those 12 things extraordinarily, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, um, because human beings evolved because we we are able to pick out what's different. You know, yeah. that human being who looked at the bush would be able to see that there's one red berry sticking out. Mm-hmm. And so that's what you pluck. And um, if you're just you, and I I incur I put stuff up that knowingly has mistakes in it. Yeah. Because people tell me all the time, they're like, well, maybe you could get away with this. I could never get away with this. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, hey, my videos are full of mistakes. I just do not call attention to them. I do not act like it's or you funny. or you call it out and make make a joke of it, right? Yeah, or I play it for laughs. Yeah, yeah. So so talking about April Fools, um, I love I love April Fools pranks, and I've always done quite elaborate ones at Clockwise, some of which <laughs> you know involve the spaghetti harvest in Switzerland, and you know all sorts of things. Um, so last year, I thought so I have a series called the Naked Video Series, and I thought I'd make a you know, a joke of my own naked video series. So the naked video series, um, the tagline is where the only thing naked is the video. So basically it's just raw video, more or less raw video and Mm -hmm. giving myself permission to just like blah, right? Mm -hmm. So I figured um, I'll I'll announce on April 1st that we're going to take it a step further and that not only the video was going to be naked and I shot it like here up and I, I was not wearing a top and you couldn't see anything but my bare shoulders and people didn't get it. It just... It just went like, Wink. and I was like, oh, my God, this video is now out of me. I'm looking like I'm naked. <laughs> That's totally, totally lost my mind. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I give up. No more, no more jokes. Um, but, I mean, and again, and you know, in passing on LinkedIn, everything happens so fast. No one really gives a flying, at, you know what, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but I'm like, okay, so not all comedy resonates with all people and i think i know i'm a little nervous sometimes because i i spent the first 10 to 15 years in america apologizing for being rude when all i was being was european funny um you know so i'm always very w- nervous about alienating people the, the wrong people the people i actually would like to work with right or am i just being way too cautious and the people who get my sense of humor are the people I should be working with. I don't know. Well, so, you know, part of the reason why people hire me as a coach is because like, when I say I was doing sketch comedy and improv for 15 years, a lot of that was bombing, Mm. you know, Mm -hmm. and um, you have to fail in order to figure out what works. Works, And I, you know, it's one of those things and I've seen it in business too, where someone's just like, man, my sales presentation was amazing. That stupid audience. They weren't paying attention. They were clicking around in zoom. Yeah. (laughs) And I would see comedians too. Who'd be like, "Ugh, my bit was so funny. That stupid audience didn't get it. Yeah. And it's like, well, you're the comedian. So your job here is to make them laugh. So if they didn't get it, that's on you. Yeah. And um, humor is a very subtle thing. And, Um, you know, like The Onion, if you've ever read The Onion, um, the satirical newspaper, there are legendary stories where their writers will fight bitterly. They'll fight for 30 minutes over a single comma placement. Okay. Because humor is very subtle, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So it's like- The Onion was ever known for being subtle. Yeah, well, the I mean, they're very clever. Um, Do you know that like, the Onion was the first newspaper that published a joke after nine eleven? 
Um, I remember the Onions 9-11, yeah. uh, post 9-11 one. So we yeah. could talk about that too, because I thought that was brilliantly done. Yeah. Um, if anybody's never read it, The Onion, uh, September 11th, uh, 2001, after the, the World Trade Center uh, fell, um, there was this month where nobody, everybody was afraid to do comedy. Everybody was afraid. And The Onion released their issue and it was really funny and i remember like some of the headlines was like one of them was um it was like hugging up 1400,000 percent <laughs> you know um one of them was like not knowing what else to do woman bakes american flag cake yeah and um and again, then they actually and called out something about bin laden i mean they were really i mean they they, they were sort of they gave the country basically permission again to to laugh and to have that release i i really i really thought it as you it's say cathartic. it's really brilliant it it's was cathartic really and um and this is a thing again and this is why i say like when people hire me to come in and make content with them they're getting my perspective they're getting me as an audience member and a director and a co-writer yeah. Um, but part of it is like, yeah, there is this delicate dance you have to do where it's like, there are real human feelings here that we need to acknowledge, that we need to find a way to make playful and make relatable mm -hmm. without diminishing the seriousness of what happened. Yeah. And whenever I do something, whenever I do, like, I, you know, I've got a sketch. Anybody, if you want to follow my LinkedIn today, I've got a new sketch that's going to be dropping in about an hour. Um and you know, we're talking about diversity. We're talking about vulnerability. We're talking about very serious topics, but we're doing it in this very funny way um, because you you want to acknowledge the reality mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe you're satirizing your discomfort or, um, you know, something that's specific to you, but you don't want to attack people and you don't want to come from a place of judgment. And I find that's where people really get into trouble with comedy um, but if you're focusing on the truth, again, just, you know, that Onion article, hugging up 140,000%, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, okay, you can make a joke about everyone is just hugging each other constantly um, without diminishing the lives that were lost. Yeah. You know, you, you don't have to act like it's a unnecessary thing, but you could just comment, certainly we are hugging all the time uh, because we all just went through this traumatic thing together. Mm -hmm. And um that's the other thing I say too, is I don't worry about cancel culture. I'm different than most comedians, or at least a lot of the comedians you hear talking about cancel culture because uh, I've worked with a lot of diverse writers. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, it's like when you're coming in as an outsider who's judging, yeah, that's where you get into trouble. And I say, I learned more from writing with black writers, you know, and gay writers and trans writers and women and, you know, um, people who aren't just white men. Um, yeah. When it's a bunch of white guys sitting around judging people, it can come off as very mean spirited. Um, but when you're working with people and they're from diverse groups mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, no, trust me, this bit is going to kill. <laughs> you know, we know our audience. And yes, um, exactly. yeah. Th that's yeah. also a better group where if you are, you know, maybe saying something that's a little rude, maybe something that's going to come off a little offensive. Um, it's better to have one of your fellow writers pull you aside and be and like, hey, by great. the way. I would not recommend throwing that joke in there. And here's why, you know, mm -hmm. and um, when it's coming from a place of shared goals and, you know, it's like, we're both trying to win over the same audience. We're both trying to make the show succeed. You can free your ego from it, you know, and you don't have to take it as a personal attack. And um, yeah, the more you create with other types of people, the more you just learn about life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think um, having that, you know, having that diversity come in and um, cause I think, you know, culturally, you know, what is funny to us might not be funny to a Brit might not totally bomb in, in, in Asia or, you know, yeah. So you, you need all those different views to. But you'd be surprised. It's one of those things where it's like the reason why I am doing this and the thing I learned in sales, again, elite professors, you know, people are like, Oh, these hoity toity people. I got to show up being hoity toity. And it's like, hey, you know what? Just because someone makes a certain amount of money doesn't mean they stop laughing, yeah. you know? And part of what I'm doing is like, I remember, I know we're like at our time here, but I'll, I'll share one story that was that changed the way I thought about everything forever. Mm -hmm. I was very young. I was like 19 years old. 
I was in college. I got hired to do one of my first ever gigs. I was with my improv group and we got hired to play a black tie Oscar party. Right. So these are these are mostly retired people, you know, fancy drinks, fancy soiree. We're sitting there in our button down shirts that we bought. And um, we had this new form that we came up with. When you're doing long form improv, that means you're doing like a 45 minute set where you're getting one suggestion and you just go. Yeah. And, um, you know, in Chicago, it's kind of pretentious. You come up with all these different forms. You have all these complicated underlying structures that you're doing. And we had this new form that we made. And we're like, oh, this is a variation on the LaRonde and uh, combined with a Herald and blah, blah, blah. It was all just very inside baseball stuff. And so we go up there and we're doing this, what we think is this very high-minded show for this very high-minded audience. And we're bombing. No one's laughing. And we're like, oh, God. And someone makes a fart joke. <laughs> and everybody and the room lights up they're dying and we all just look at each other and we're like fart jokes fart okay fart jokes. and we just we did the bluest show it was so crass and all these rich people were just dying laughing yeah and i learned i'm like you know what it's just like if you sh if if it's funny they will laugh you know and and and, and you know and and sometimes you do want to have you want to have that campy silly as you and you said it's like a catharsis right so um especially if you're in a very sort of uh, culture that is very um regulated i think the more so it's important to have that kind of outlet um to just be you know, dumbass, stupid, silly, you know, that's, that's, I think that's really, I, important. I mean, like, you know, um, I, I don't play there right now, but like boom, Chicago is a theater in Amsterdam. And one of my comedian friends who's very influential in like, we did sketch comedy together for a long time. He plays there. Mm -hmm. um, boom, Chicago is where like Seth Meyers came from and like a bunch of other comedians. And, um, you know, they play for an international audience and I, yeah. I'm actually trained second city, um, where I was trained in Chicago is a little bit more like highbrow. They teach you like, go for that obscure reference. Just, uh, just assume your audience is going to get it. So yeah. it has this very kind of like sarcastic kind of, um, you know, knowledge -y kind of base to it. Boom Chicago, when you're dealing with international audiences, that is very much more a physical show. That's much more about physical comedy. Yeah, because um, that's assume, the church, yeah. yeah, assume your audience might not be speaking the same language as you. Mm -hmm. um, can you make them laugh anyways? You know, yeah. so um, the things that are real, again, maybe mm -hmm. my audience can't understand me, but if I'm sitting there waiting for a bus, and I'm just kind of nervous there. The audience is going to laugh because they're like, I felt that I've sat there. I know what that's like. Yeah. And a lot of time it's much simpler, you know, it's yeah. biting into something and it's like, ooh, you know, um, mm -hmm. that reads the same, no matter who you are, no matter where yes. you are, no matter how much money you have. Cause that's just a human condition, right? That's all that comedy is. It's just yeah. the truth. Yeah. yeah. And then of course you could get into the whole talk about what is the truth. Right. But, um, yes. <laughs> I <laughs> mean, the, the thing I'll say is just don't lie. You know, yeah, that's yeah. truth. Maybe, maybe your truth, um, you know, people believe different things at different points in their life, but whatever it is you feel, as long as, as you know it's true. Um, that was another, we didn't get into this because we're, it was, we covered plenty in this interview, but I am also, there's another school of theater in Chicago called Neo Futurism, which is very obscure, but was very big on um, my style. Mm -hmm. um, because it is the opposite of Second City. You are not allowed to play characters. It is a hyper honesty where okay. you are only allowed to be you and you are taking the audience on an experience with you. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, the interesting thing about my video and the interesting thing about anybody's video is that it's a human being and they're looking directly at you. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I really, what I, for me, what I'm walking away here with is sort of the... Um, the fourth wall to really, you know, address that much in a much more also historical context, right? Not just you have to look at the green light, but g give it, you know, give it, give it context. And then I love the character idea, even if it's still you showing up the way you are, but, you know, having, you had the Lisa's and Lisa is always my favorite uh, example as well. So, you know, having having the Lisa's, I really love that idea of sort of um, giving yourself also permission to to be that person and to sort of slip into that role, right? Yeah. When are you? When are you a funnier 
more open version of yourself. When is that a better idea to show up as that version of you in yeah. business? Yeah. And then who's the version of you that like gets it done? Mm -hmm. And you know, the person who achieved things and accomplished things. Okay. Maybe that's the person that needs to show up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's all about status. I know. I I know. I keep saying we're at the end of the interview here, but one quick thing that I, I a game that I learned a good time here <laughs> in improv. Um, we used to play a game called card status, mm -hmm. and um, I think about this a lot in business. How you play card status is two characters. Or it's a, it's a, it's not a game you play for an audience. It's a game you play in practice. Mm -hmm. um, but what you do is the two improvisers each pull a card out of a deck of cards, and um, Ace is the lowest status. Ace is a one mm -hmm. and King is the highest status. Yeah. Right. And um, how high your number is, is how much status you have in the scene. So mm -hmm. characters who are a one who are very low status characters, they're super apologetic. They're running all over the place. They're nervous. Um, <laughs> if you're a King, if you have the top most status, mm -hmm. you can do anything. Think like Meryl Streep in the devil wears Prada. Um, you know, it's, it's a character who everybody moves towards you. You, yeah. you sit there, you don't have to say much. Yeah. Um, you know, you command respect. And, uh, the interesting scenes were always were like one player is a seven and the other one is an eight. Ooh, the yeah. Cool. yeah. Cause now you're fighting for, or you, yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah. It's, it it's can that, switch at any time. Nuance, um, yeah. I find that's very, it's very important in sales, especially mm -hmm. is thinking about like, do they want a high status character or a low status character? And, um, I always say, I, I always decide like, which one of us is Batman? <laughs> you know, if someone <laughs> hires me mm -hmm. because they're like, Hey, um, I'm starting a business. I don't know anything about sales. I don't know anything about video help. Yeah. They want me to be the hero. They want me to come in as a high status character right. Right. and say, you know what? This is what you got to do. I'm going to take care of you. You're going to do X and Y and Z and you're going to do, do great. Yeah. Um, if I'm selling to a CEO, mm -hmm. they are a high status character. Yeah. <laughs> and if you try to out Batman a CEO, you're not going to get very that's, far. That's not going to be, that's not going to be, um, bills paid fastly. Yeah. 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 If uh, if I'm selling to a CEO, they either want me to be Robin or they want me to be Alfred, right? <laughs> if they want me to be Robin, that means they're the hero, yeah. right? And I'm saying, hey, you know what? You should be out there uh, saving Gotham. Why mm -hmm. are you fighting low-level thugs on the street? Yeah. Um, why don't you let me take care of this problem and you can go out there and save the world? Nice. Um, or they want me to be Alfred. You know, what they want is they want a little bit of professional distance, Mm -hmm. Want me to show up and tell them why this thing I'm selling is the new thing that they need in their tool belt, you know? And I just explain, hey, you know what? This is graphite. It comes in black. This is good if you're scaling up walls. Um, <laughs> might that be something you need? Yeah, you know. And then they buy it, and you go along your way, you know. But it's just yeah. figuring yeah. out, okay, does this is this person? Do they want me to be higher status than them? Yeah. Or yeah. am I dealing with a very confident person who already has plenty of ego? Uh, mm -hmm. And I just need to convince them that I'm going to be the one that's going to help them get the job done. Yeah. You know, but figuring out, once you figure out that, um, then you can figure out, okay, which version of me is the best for that? You know, maybe they're a teacher. I'm going to show up as my best student. Yes. And I'm going to let them be the, I'm going to let them teach me mm -hmm. because that's going to get me a lot farther than trying to teach them. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Very perceptive. Very, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I have a vague feeling you and I could go on for about another week or so. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to stop it before. <laughs> yeah, um, this is lovely. Yes, this was wonderful. And as my, as my mom always said, which I hated hearing as a teenager, you got to leave the party when it's the most fun. I'm like, no, I don't. Oh, and I I'm say that you got to leave your audience wanting more. Exactly. You so, always want to leave yeah. them. And that's, that's the thing I learned in improv. It's always fine to cut the scene short. Yeah. Because you can always bring that character back 20 minutes later. And the yeah. audience is like, yes, this guy's back. back. <laughs> All right. So let's hope our audience is going to be, yes, Chris is back when we bring you on um, yeah. again. Ring the bell. Follow me on LinkedIn. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So please find Chris on LinkedIn. I put a link into the comments of his newest skit that's promoting his newest... Show? Is that what it is? Yeah, that's um, yeah. The, my most recent podcast episode. Okay. So Find your people. Yeah, I put that into, I actually went over to to um, LinkedIn and put it there. 
um, because I come to it from StreamYard for some odd reason. And I'm also, once when, when I'm done with the show, I'm going to throw in, actually can do it right now, I'll throw in your LinkedIn. So Chris, where do people find you? LinkedIn, right? Yeah, LinkedIn is the best place. You can also find me on TikTok at Chris Sells His Soul. Uh, you can find my podcast uh, anywhere podcasts are located. So if you look up Chris Sells His Soul in Apple or Google Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify, uh, you'll find me there. And you can catch me live tomorrow uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll be doing my show, Chris Sells His Soul, live at 3 p.m. with Carl Watkins for our new episode, Vulnerable. So I'll be interviewing him tomorrow. And you can catch our new sketch promoting that later this afternoon. Awesome. So Chris Sells His Soul, I just put that into the chat. And I'm going to put your LinkedIn into the chat. And then... You know, you all know how to get a hold of him and watch him. Watch his stuff on LinkedIn. It's hilarious. I uh, has some great stuff in the featured section. And um, yeah, a whole whole new world opens up. And if you're on TikTok for sure, I might actually download it back on my phone again and uh, give it a second look. <laughs> awesome. Chris, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be with us today. I really enjoyed spending this time with you. And thank you for all the the fun we had. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me, Nina. All right. Be well, and we'll see you all in a month from now. Bye. Bye-bye.